Welcome to day 53. We begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask you to open our hearts and minds as we pray this prayer from St. Augustine, our patron and intercessor. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, we are getting closer and closer to the end. Uh, we're into the final two weeks. And I am excited because today, in our Principles and Hints, we move into section five, numeral uh, five, um, and the title of today is The Practice of the Liturgical Life, and there's two parts to this, and we're going to do the first part today, which is remote preparation, and then tomorrow will be immediate preparation. So without further ado, let us begin. The Practice of the Liturgical Life. Good Master, you have deigned to give me some understanding of what the liturgical life is. Am I going to try and offer the duties of my ministry as a pretext for avoiding the effort which you demand, in order that I may put all this into practice? Surely you would answer that it will take no more time to fulfill my liturgical functions in the way you desire me to, than it does already to get through them mechanically. You would tell me to consider the example of so many of your servants, like Blessed Father Père Borrière, among others, who charged by you with unceasing and deeply absorbing occupations to a degree of the highest intensity, was nevertheless a most perfect example of a, quote, liturgical soul. A. Remote Participation Dear Savior, Turn my desire for a liturgical life into a powerful spirit of faith with respects to everything that has to do with divine worship. Your angels and saints see you face to face. Nothing can distract their minds from the august functions which go to make up one of the elements of their incomparable bliss. But I, on the other hand, still a prey to all the weaknesses of human nature, simply cannot keep myself in your presence when I unite with the church in addressing you, unless you develop in me the gift of faith which I received at baptism. May I never come to regard my liturgical functions as a burdensome duty, to get over and done with as soon as possible, or something be put up with for the sake of the fee. Never, I hope, will I dare to speak of the thrice holy God, or carry out his rites with careless familiarity an insulting negligence, which I would be ashamed to manifest to his most humble servant. May I never give scandal to those things which were expressly designed to edify. And yet, can I foresee how far I will fall if I once cease to watch myself in this matter of the spirit of faith? Oh my God, if I am already sliding down this perilous incline, have mercy, pull me back. Or rather, Give me so lively a faith that I will be gripped by the importance that all liturgical acts really possess in your sight, and will rejoice to feel their sublime wonders flood my will with an ever-growing enthusiasm. Can it be said that I have the slightest spirit of faith if I take no trouble to know the rubrics and to observe them? This is a neglect for which not even the most lofty and appreciative in intuitions about the liturgy can compensate in your sight, O oh my God. What difference does it make if I feel no natural attention for this task? It is enough for me to know that my obedience is pleasing to you, and that it will gain me great merit. On my retreats, I must never fail to examine myself on this point with regard to the missal, ritual, and breviary. Your church, O oh Jesus, has chiefly drawn upon the treasures of the Psalms for her cult. If I have any liturgical spirit, my soul will be able to see you in passages from the Psalter, especially in your life of suffering. 
and I will be able to realize that the words, the deep thoughts which came forth from the secret depths of your heart and rose to, up to God during your mortal life are to be found written down in the very many of the prophetic verses which you inspired your psalmist. And there I will be able to discern, gather together in a most marvelous synthesis, a forecast of the chief teachings of your gospel. Under these same veils, I will detect the voice of the church as she carries on your life in trials and expresses to God in the midst of all her sufferings and triumphs sentiments that echo those of her divine spouse, sentiments which may also be appropriated in all temptations, reverses, combats, sorrows, discouragement, deceptions, as well as in victory and consolation by every soul in whom your life can be manifested. If I set aside part of my reading time for Holy Scripture exclusively, I shall develop my taste for the liturgy and make it easier to keep my mind on his words. Reflective observation will show that every liturgical composition has a central idea about which the various teachings are grouped. Oh, what weapons, my soul, will you thus forge against thy ever-roving imagination, especially if you know how to learn from symbols? The church makes use of symbols to speak to the senses a language which captivates them, making the truths that are represented sensible. Agnostite quod agitis. Realize what you are doing, she told me at my ordination. Ceremonies, sacred linen, holy objects, vestments, all speak with a meaningful voice, given them by the church, my mother. How am I ever going to enlighten the understandings and reach the hearts of the faithful that the church wants to capture by her naive and grandiose speech if I myself do not possess the key to such instruction? And so we conclude our section for today. We will continue on uh, with the next several sections in the days of head. So one of the biggest things that struck me as we were reading uh, today is the fact of making sure that we try and resist the distractions that might come to us. But another is to pay attention to the rubrics. What is it that I am supposed to be doing, saying, and you know, how am I supposed to be participating in the Mass? If I don't even know the rubrics, you know, which is what I'm supposed to do, how am I supposed to participate? But the one that really struck me, and this would be our resolution for today, is to set aside part of our reading time for Holy Scripture exclusively so we can develop our taste for the liturgy and make it easier to keep our mind on its words. One of the greatest struggles, I think, is that we'll hear the words of, like, the Eucharistic prayers, for example, and we'll kind of zone out because we'll lose track of what they're saying or we don't really understand it. If we spend time with Holy Scripture, with God's Word, then what happens is, is that then our mind um, and, and heart is transformed and our ear becomes attuned to the way of liturgical expression because it's similar to God's word because we're offering the liturgy is an offering of our praise to God. So what I want you to do today in particular and then continue if, if you find it to be a benefit, um, I actually would say uh, do this resolution for at least a week, um, but set aside part of your reading time for Holy Scripture exclusively. Spend five minutes each day reading Scripture. Read it aloud, and then your ear becomes attuned, and you become ever more capable of being able to be attentive and not be distracted because you're hearing the words of praise and you're able to enter into them fully, actively, consciously. Your participation then becomes your whole self. And this is what we are to strive to do at each and every Mass. So know my continued prayers for each and every one of you, particularly as you pursue this resolution. And I will see you all tomorrow. God bless.